Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Open Data Science Conference San Francisco. Um, welcome, Scott. Um, I'm going to introduce Scott and then going to give the podium to him. Um, so Scott Draves is an award-winning software artist, BJ, and a pioneer of the open source movement. His clients and exhibitions range from the likes of MoMA, Google, and the Adler Planetarium to Skrillex. He has a PhD in computer science from Carnegie Mellon and a BS in math from Brown. Drapes is now the lead developer of Breaker Notebook for Two Sigma Open Source. Welcome, Scott, and thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction, and thank you all for your attention this afternoon. So I'm going to be telling you about the Beaker Notebook, uh, which is the data scientist's laboratory. And in particular, I'm going to go over the advanced user interface that we've put together and the polyglot architecture uh, behind that interface and explain how that allows you to focus on your data and your science instead of getting you know, distracted by your tools and your technology. So uh, a little bit, but before I tell you about Beaker, I want to tell you sort of uh, give you some context and tell you where Beaker came from. And that would be Two Sigma, which is a technology company that applies data science, machine learning, and statistical artificial intelligence to investment management. So we're based in Soho in, in New York. And Two Sigma, we've been around for like 15 years, and we collect large amounts of data. Uh, we study that data. Uh, we try to develop an understanding of that data. We build algorithmic models of that data. is a tool that we built for our own data scientists. And we, we use it in-house. And we decided to release it as open source so that data scientists, and actually all kinds of scientists, can use it to improve their process and improve their results. And uh, we, we hope you uh, can benefit from it and, and enjoy it. So now, uh, so let's talk about the process of science. And in particular, uh, let's talk about the laboratory notebook. So this is canonically a piece of, uh, you know, a book with graph paper. Uh, it's in the, it sits in the, in the laboratory, and there's a long tradition of, of scientists using their notebooks for all kinds of things. You know, as you're doing experiments, you kind of use it as a diary, you record your data, you record your ideas, you know, notes to yourself, um, and it's really a free-form, multimedia uh, experience. You know, people can draw pictures, you can have tables, you can have graphs, you can have mathematics, you can have coffee stains. Uh, everything goes in the notebook. And so this is the part of science where uh, you don't really know the answer yet. And you might, even, you might not even know the question. You're just exploring. So it's, uh, it's important that, you know, that's where, uh, that's where the free form nature uh, comes in. And so here's just a couple on the slide. There's a couple of quick examples of famous scientists' notebooks. Um, there are, some of these are pretty hard to, to get, but let's start with an easy one. Does anyone recognize the notebook in the lower left with the anatomical drawings? I, sorry, I heard it. Da Vinci, great. That's right. And how about this one's a little harder. Just, just as famous a scientist, but the one in the lower right corner. Does anyone recognize this scientist? He does a lot of math. OK, no, no, no hands jumping up. OK. I, I heard it. Einstein, that's right. Very good. Maybe. Um, so 
Uh, so lab notebooks worked for these guys. Maybe they'll work for you too. <laughs> but but we can do better than paper. So the the idea of the Beaker notebook is to update this idea uh, for the digital age, and you know these days that means that means computers. So in, in in the Beaker notebook, you know your document, the thing that you work on, we call it we call it a notebook, and you can put all the same kinds of media types into your notebook. You can put prose, you can put mathematical equations, you can put tables of data, you can have graphs, and the important addition, the thing that we get, the thing that computers do, is you, you can have code. And so that's really sort of the new medium uh, that, that Beaker is trying to open up. And Beaker really is a, a product for, for coders. And, um, but that begs the question of what language is the code in? And Beaker's approach Beaker's answer is to leave that as a variable. Because uh, each part of your notebook, each cell, each paragraph of code can actually be written in a different language. And we support all the standard uh, langu the languages of data science, including, for example, Python, Python 3, R, up and new, new up and coming languages like Julia that you maybe heard about today. Uh, also, some standard languages that may not be directly associated with, with uh, data science, like JavaScript. JavaScript might not be where you do your regression, but it might be really good for doing an interactive visualization. Uh, we support Java, Clojure, C, pretty much uh, all the majors. And actually, I'm going to call out one more. We have direct support we recently added for the SQL queries. And so you can program in SQL without like putting it in a string or wrapping it in some kind of like weird API. You can just write SQL with get nice, you know, with autocomplete and syntax highlighting and uh, everything that you might expect. And so, but why would you really want uh, multiple languages? That sounds sort of scary and complicated, uh, but there's actually lots of situations where this comes in useful. And there's one, I'll, I'll mention a couple of them. Uh, one is that, you know, each language was actually, is uh, usually really good at something. It's usually the thing that the creator of that language does. And so it's really nice, you know, problems have many parts. And it's, it would be cool if each part of your problem you could solve in the language which was best suited for doing that thing. So that's, that's one reason you might want to work in multiple languages. And so as a very quick example, you can see at the bottom of the slide, you might uh, want to scrape the web in Python. It has some great APIs for doing that. But then you might want to do a regression in R, because R has some libraries uh, that are good for that. But then do an interactive d3.js visualization in your web browser, because JavaScript is good for that. Another situation where you might want to program in multiple languages is with collaboration. Like, say you want to work with somebody, and you like Python, and they like R. You know, you don't you don't have to uh, fight about it. Uh, you can just uh, you can work on the same notebook, on the same data, each in your own language, and, and working together. Those are only two reasons. There's just there's many many more. It seems like every situation uh, has its own motivation. But, but there is a danger. You know, the problem that you get with uh, uh, the, the problem of too many languages is, is an ancient problem. In the Bible, we, they called it, the, you know, they warned us about the Tower of Babel. Um, and so we were, in order to avoid that problem, Beaker has a, a novel feature that we call auto-translation. And what that does is automatically translate your data between your languages so that the different cells in your notebook can communicate with each other, even if they're in separate address spaces and separate languages. And so this slide has a, a very quick example 
with the, in the little in the boxes on the bottom. You can see in the lower left, say in one cell, in the Python language, you can say beaker.x equals 10. And then in another cell in JavaScript, you can say beaker.x plus one, and you get the value 11. So it, it's, it's really that simple. No procedure call, you know, no special uh, interface definition language. Uh, it's just automatic. We use metaprogramming to create this magic beaker object that exists in all the languages simultaneously. And it's kind of like a smoke and mirrors thing to make it uh, to automatic to turn the setting the data there to make it work everywhere. And we use that beaker object, we're using JSON as our sort of universal uh, data format, our interchange format. And that makes sense because Beaker is in fact a web application. It runs in your web browser and so JavaScript and JSON are really kind of the native languages for Beaker. Now, uh, so let me just tell you uh, a little bit about now how that works. And so behind the scenes, this is a architectural diagram about uh, of Beaker. And it's showing you, there's a, there's a lot here going on in the implementation. Uh, I just want to point out a few things very, very quickly here. And in particular, that the, there's plugins for each of the languages. So we've implemented about 20 languages so far, but there are many more out there. Everyone seems to have their own favorite or is even creating their own language these days. And so we have an API for adding new ones. Uh, and when you, when you do add a language, you know, we, it, the best thing to do is really to talk to the existing implementation of that. So for example, when you're running Python in Beaker, we're actually talking to a regular Jupyter or IPython backend. So Beaker talks to the Python that you already have installed on your laptop or on your computer. And when you run R in Beaker, you're talking to the R that you already have. And that's really useful because people have sometimes compiled their own version, they have an old version, they have all kinds of, maybe they have some crazy libraries they've installed that they had to tweak and they finally got it all working and you know they don't want to, uh, you don't want to mess with having to like reinstall and using like a fresh version of your favorite backend. So Beaker just talks to the languages you already have. And uh, we also have a really advanced modern JavaScript architecture. So we're, Beaker is built with the Angular you know, MVC library, and so it's really easy to sort of uh, create new output types. Like, you know, like I said, we have, it's a multimedia environment we support things like tables and charts and images, but if you want to add your own media type, your own sort of form of interaction, we have a, a plugin API for that. And it's easy to do because within your plugin, you can use Angular. Uh, and so you can use like the latest JavaScript technologies to, to build your interactions. Now, so just to, to review, uh, Beaker is an open source tool for doing data science. It has an advanced user interface, and it has a polyglot architecture. And what I'm going to do now, uh, just a few more, uh, most, of, most of the talk, I think I have uh, another 20 minutes or so, I'm going to be giving uh, a live demo running through some examples of how Beaker works, and I'm going to really show you that user interface, and I'm going to show you how to do the polyglot, uh, how the polyglot stuff works. Uh, but uh, just but, but before I get into that, I just do want to say uh, our website, you can get Beaker, you can download it from beakernotebook.com, and you can subscribe to our Twitter feed uh, under the name Beaker Notebook to receive updates on everything that's happening 
uh, in, in the world of Beaker. And once again, we're, it's, uh, we're co it's coming from Two Sigma, and we are hiring both developers, people like me who are sort of building Beaker Notebook, building these tools, but we're also hiring scientists and data scientists, uh, sort of users, uh, uh, if, if, that's, if that's your thing. So now, let me just switch tracks here. Here we go. Okay, is the text legible on the screen over there? Okay, great. So here's my first quick example, uh, and it's going to be indeed uh, connecting Python with JavaScript and D3. So Here's some, uh, a quick piece of code that creates a random graph in JavaScript. And by graph, I mean like a social network kind of a graph with, with nodes and edges. It's a pretty uh, straightforward thing. It's just a loops over the number of nodes and gives them names. And then it loops over, oops, the, it loops over the number of edges, uh, which is just a bit larger than the number of nodes, and it connects them together, and it connects them with this kind of weird little mathematical equation. Uh, and it puts the whole thing in a data structure and assigns it to the beaker object, okay? So if we run that, uh, there's nothing to see, because, uh, but if we, if I actually look at, if I actually look at this, uh, value directly, you can see it is just a data structure. Uh, kind of hard to understand, lots of, lots of numbers there. Uh, in order, let's visualize that. So in order to visualize it, the first thing I need, and I want to do it with the D3, in order to do it with D3, the first thing we need to do is to find some, some styles, CSS, and create a div in order to hold the visualization. And then the next thing is I'm going to create a force-directed graph. So that's what this D3 call right here does. And this, this uh, JavaScript code is just copy and pasted. You can see it's uh, about 50 lines of code there. This code is nothing special. It's copy and pasted from the D3 uh, gallery, just from their website. The only thing I did to make it work with the Python code is add this one line at the beginning. So I'm getting the graph to visualize from the beaker object. And that's exactly where I, I put the data with the Python, okay? And so when I run it, indeed I, I get a force-directed graph that shows me what that network looks like. And you can see it, it actually, that logarithm gave it some structure. So these, the blue nodes have lots of uh, connections, and the other ones don't. That's what the logarithm did. Uh, and so that's the, uh, my first example, a quick one, to show you how easy it is to get Python and JavaScript working together on the same page in the same notebook. Okay, now let me uh, do a little less of a canned example. You know, most people, when, when you run Beaker for the first time, you just really get it, you get a blank page, you get an empty notebook. Of course, you can start out with the tutorials or you can download something, but really when you're really working, you start out like this. And so let me show you 
sort of how you construct a notebook. So the first thing you do want to do is maybe insert a cell. And this starts out as starting out with uh, JavaScript. And you can see this is, you can just you know, write some code in here and run it, and you get an answer. So this is indeed uh, live and run, running this code. But you know, the science is, you know, the notebook can do a lot more than just do code. We want to, you know, uh, actually make a document here. So I'm going to put in a section. Uh, open data science, right? That's where we are, and there's going to be some text in here too. I am actually running from our GitHub master branch right now. Uh, a little bit risky, but you know, it's been a, about a month since our last release, and we've made a ton of improvements since then. And I, you know, when I when I go back and I run version 1.4, and I uh, and I, it looks horrible now. So I, I really I need the, the every every little detail counts. Uh, so our our text box is really nice and full featured. You can do markdown to get bold. Uh, you can do uh, you know LaTeX to do math. And, oop. Uh, and you can even do you can do HTML, and it's super fast. Uh, but let's so let's just uh, but let me just show you more uh, sort of uh, cells in action. So that was that's JavaScript and some text and a section. You know you can do the sections. Uh, you can open and close to help you sort of hide stuff you're not working on. But let's go beyond uh, JavaScript. Let's insert another language. So I, when I click go to other, I, it pops up the language manager with which lists all the languages I have available. And so let's drop in some R. So there, there's a, a quick histogram. How about some um, Python? Did I get that right? Oh. What? I'm not 100% sure why no attribute ran on. Okay, there's a, a quick data frame. And you can see another nice thing what Beaker tries to do is um, it gives you a nice user interface by default. So data frames are displayed with an interactive JavaScript visualization here. So I can do things like just click on the columns and to resort them, uh, or I can go into the menu if I say copy to clipboard. And then I can just paste it into Excel if I want to do that. So once again, Beaker is just trying to, you know, by default, have a user interface that does the right thing for you and connect to other programs to remove the barriers to doing your science. So we just don't want to get in the way. Because, you know, like if, uh, if I had just gotten a HTML table there, what can I do with it? I'm stuck. 
Okay, so next next example here. Here's here's our main tutorial. It's here, we, you can see it comes with all of these are just linked. It, it comes with a, a ton of documentation. Um, I'm going to show you one really quickly. We have a view a view menu here to sort of show the hierarchy. This is our our text uh, demo that shows you some of the more fancy things you can do with text. Markdown, math, Chinese characters. You can actually just throw HTML into our uh, text cell, and you can control color and text size. You can do template expansion. This is actually a unique feature to Beaker. Um, you know, this frequently happens when you're writing a paper for, for publication and you're maybe you're writing your conclusion and you can say, because of our great experiment, technique X increased the uh, efficiency by 10%. So, you know, that's my, so my research is great. But the 10, that value 10% is actually was computed as part of your data analysis. So if you bring in new data and rerun it, and then maybe all of a sudden it's 11%, and then you have to remember to go into your conclusion and like change that number. Uh, so what, what template expansion does, it actually allows you to, and here's an example, put into the code to refer to values that were computed by the cells. So if, I'm gonna click on this markdown cell so that you can see how it was implemented. And here's, the piece of code, I'm using the double curly braces, which is a st standard indicator of template expansion, and I'm referring to uh, beaker.log10.2 fixed of three. So here, I put the log 10 uh, into the beaker object, and that's this long decimal, but of course, in my prose, I only want to show a couple of digits. So that just uh, is a nice, uh, feature uh, of, our, of our text cell. So here's another example. Uh, one kind of, of the Spark uh, API is an important part of data science these days. Uh, it's a cluster operating system for working with big data and doing parallel programming. And just as an example, I'm gonna do a text analysis of this book by Robert Boyle who actually got mentioned, I think, in one of the keynotes this morning. So Robert Boyle was a probably one of the first chemists. You may have noticed that Beaker has a little chemistry theme going. Uh, so we love chemistry. And uh, we love Robert Boyle. He was sort of at the transition between alchemy and, and chemistry. And he wrote this, this book. And I happen to have the book in a text file. And here's some PySpark code that uh, in parallel computes the histogram of the words in that book. And boom, uh, you know, there, 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 there they are. So that just shows you how easy it is, you know, that uh, Beaker supports the sort of extended versions of Python, sort of jazzed up versions of Python. We also support Scala, the Scala language, and so you can do Spark in its, in its native Scala if you, if you like to do that. And even the uh, Spark R, the R extensions, uh, you can also program Spark in R from Beaker. And in fact, when the Spark R was announced at the uh, Spark conference a couple months ago, the demo, the demo was done with Beaker on stage because of uh, Beaker's good R support. I think it was in, that was implemented by somebody from Alterix. So here's another sort of a uh, little slightly more substantial example showing how more complex data than just a, a scalar or a, can, can move between languages. And so Python and R probably being our mo two most popular languages. Here's an example that starts out with pandas reading uh, this Boston, a, st a very standard demographic data set. And I'm going to, I happen to know pandas pretty well, and so it has this nice drop method for getting rid of columns. But, uh, but R has this nice summary method. So it's as easy as that, beaker.getBoss, 
to get the data frame into R and run the summary function so that you can sort of see what's going on there. And then uh, R also has a ton of great visualization functions. This one computes scatter plots of all pairs of columns. So you can, you can sort of see what's going on there. And here's one thing to note. This image was, the scatter plot was rendered, as you can see maybe, as a PNG file and not as vector graphics. When I computed the histogram, it was rendered with SVG because you know, I would rather have vector graphics so they're print quality at any resolution and you know, I have a retina screen on my Mac, I want them to be super sharp. But at some point, you know, doing things with SVG in your web browser, you reach a limit on the number of data points you can really show and interact with. And so Beaker recognized if I had actually drawn this scatter plot with 10,000 points in my web browser with SVG, it might have brought my web browser to its knees. Uh, so it, it automatically switched over to a PNG representation. A corollary of being able to, of being polyglot and being able to program in multiple languages is being able to program in Python 2 and Python 3 at the same time and in the same notebook. Excuse me? <laughs> uh, just as a really quick example, so the, the mechanized library only exists in Python 2. Oops. That, uh, geez, I'm gonna have to skip this demo. I don't know what happened. That's what happens when you run for master. Uh, quick, a quick show of, of SQL. Here's SQL right in the cell. I'm doing a query. There's the answer. It shows up as a nice table. And it's totally connected with auto translation. So for example, you can do a query based on values computed in another language. And uh, here's another example of doing something non-data science-y, but you know, because Beaker is actually, it's, uh, it's designed for data science, but it's really a general purpose programming environment. And so you can, it's just a good place for messing around with code. And one of the languages uh, that we support is the node language. And so here's an example. This isn't really data science, but it's something that cool that you can do. I just started a node server with just a couple lines of code. And I'm going to create a, a div to look at the results. And now I'm going to run some JavaScript code that's going to talk to that server. So I have a client server uh, interaction running where all the code is on the same page and in the same document. So it, it did a thousand queries to that server and computed as it, as it ran, you can see it actually computed uh, the average time it took to make each HTTP call and printed out the result at the end. So one thing you, so one thing you can do, let me just, uh, I'm gonna show you a, one of our tutorials. We have our own interactive uh, charting uh, API that's sort of similar to Boca or uh, GGViz in that it creates interactive JavaScript visualizations. So here's a, a very quick example showing a uh, price chart and you can sort of scroll around, you can uh, zoom in. And if you mouse over, it tells you exact values. So pretty standard kinds of plot interactions. And so say you've, uh, if you're happy with what you've got, let's say, oh, I'm just gonna do it over here. Um, you 
we have a nice, uh, an important part of research is sharing your results. And Beaker supports that with one-click publication. So in this case, I'm going to publish just this one cell of the notebook. And I'm going to, I'm going to do this unlisted because I don't really want everyone to see it. But with one, with, one quilt, with one quick click or a couple of clicks, now I've created a web page. Let me sort of make this clear. I'll show you the whole browser. So this is a URL that I can just send to anyone. You know, if I just paste that URL, boom, uh, I get the, uh, and this is just one cell. This is just the one cell out of this. You can see this, this notebook actually has you know, tons of stuff in it. This is just a, a showing off the API for our, our charting library. And you could publish the whole, the whole notebook too, if you wanted, and we have this publication server where people can share where people can share their results, and that's 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 great. If you uh, and of course you can share you can publish your results that are unlisted too. So if you don't want people to, uh, if you only want to share it with the people who have the link, you can do that too. But if you want to promote yourself and share your results with everybody, you can you know get on the front page. And so here's some, this is what the front page looked. You can see some sort of stuff that people are doing with Beaker, people who want to show off. And just as, a, just as an example, here, here's a, uh, a couple of third party, you know, pe people who just shared uh, a notebook. So let's see, where's one? This protein one is interesting. This, this came from, I think, an, an undergrad somewhere in, in Maryland. It's actually a pretty big notebook. It takes a, a, a few seconds to load here. Okay, and this he he was doing uh, research in protein visualization and how mutations can affect how proteins um, move in three dimensions. So it's pretty much it's a bunch of Python code that funnels into a D three uh, visualization. So this is a chord diagram which shows how like the different protein, the uh, different uh, gene sequences were related in 3D according to this protein. And one, one more final example, uh, rap graph. This actually just came from the Y-Hack, the hackathon at Yale last weekend, where this undergraduate, uh, Ed, Ed Lee, wrote a notebook that could take any lyrics and analyze the rhymes in, in them. And so this is an M&M rhyme, uh, an M&M rap. And he actually, he's using the CMU NLP toolkit. It has a, a phoneme database, the CMU dictionary, and then also a uh, Smith-Waterman uh, algorithm, which is actually designed for analyzing gene sequences. But he would apply that to uh, phoneme sequences in order to find more subtle rhymes, because not every rhyme is like the sort of the, the obvious kind. And then he connected that to, uh, here's the JavaScript that does a D3 visualization uh, of what words rhyme with which other ones. And you can actually see some interesting sort of structure here, of how from line to line there's essentially parallel rhyming going on, where word after word rhymes uh, with the previous line, but in, but in different ways. So that's uh, uh, an interesting use of sort of data science in a domain that's uh, really fun. So those are my demos. Uh, I think we have a few minutes for questions. If anyone uh, uh, has anything they want to ask. Thank you very much. Uh, right there. Our next steps. Uh, so actually, our, our roadmap is published on our GitHub account. Uh, right now, we are working on performance, and then we're working on um, rearchitecting to support um, uh, moving the notebook model to the server. That'll support collaborative real-time editing 
It'll support disconnected evaluation. So you can imagine you can run a set, you can be in your office, connect to your server, run a cell, and then disconnect, go, go home an hour later, connect to the same notebook and get the result. Um, and also that'll allow handling much larger notebooks. You know, right now, um, you know, you're, you're storing the notebook in the web browser uh, doesn't work for a, a past a certain number of megabytes. So if, if, it's, if the notebook is stored on the server and we're only showing you in your web browser the subset that you can see, then we can support much larger uh, notebooks and we can sort of stream the data to it as you look at it. So that's uh, some of the stuff we're working on. Another question? Go ahead. Uh, you, 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 you can't pass functions. That's a, an astute question. Uh, it's actually, um, I believe, uh, it's something that's theoretically possible, and it's never going to be fast, because when you call a function, you're going to have to do an RPC back to the language in which it was defined. But uh, it, it's, it's really useful. It's just a lot harder, and we're, we are going to get there eventually. Another thing. Uh, that I didn't explain is that we translate, the auto translation works for basic data types, it works for the basic data structures, it even works for some complex classes like data frames. But if you're programming in Java and you define your own class that is special and that's your special class, and then you try to translate that to JavaScript where there is no definition for that class, it's, it's not going to work. In that case, it just does a you know, a plain translation of the, of the data. And so, uh, but there is a way to sort of define handlers. You can, so if you can define, uh, you, you can add extensions to the auto translation to handle that, but it's, that's not automatic. Another so, question? So we're actually, oh, we're out of actually time? running out of time. Yeah. Okay. So Scott will be in the back of the room and you take some of your questions offline. Um, can you give another round of applause? For Scott? Thanks again.